Bruchem Abayim B'Shem Hashem B'Shem Egin Shir Teremos It's possible I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's Shir from Rabbi Shol Shem and Doit Shrita Like you'll be Gashi Koyach to Mr. and Mrs. Noach Karas for sponsoring tonight's Shir to have the great Schuss for sponsoring your Shir or to have the opportunity I have a Chedig and a Botzis Torah the Rabbim of Egin Shir Teremos by putting an ad in the dinner journal an occasion of Egin Shir Teremos annual dinner which is next Wednesday August 24th could honor one of the Rabbanim who Shurim you've enjoyed, or uh, whatever dedication you may like to place. Call Egan Shur Tara 718-851-8651 or email IST at yeshivanad.com. Tonight we have the cover to have us once again of Shalshim and Deutsch, founder of Living Torah Museum, the Yasnarov, on bringing ancient Jewish life and Torah Judaism alive. It's my cover to corner by Deutsch for tonight's Joshua and presentation. I always try to talk about in Yoni Diyoma, things where we're holding in that part of the year. We're now in a time where we just finished the three weeks, Shabbos Nachamu. We're in a time when the mitzvah of Bikurim was being brought by Klal Yisrael from Shavuos to Sukkot. We're in a time that we just finished learning the Aseris Hadibris, and we're in a time that next week we're going to be learning about many different animals, what's kosher, what's not kosher, and I'm going to try within an hour to dedicate some time on all of these subjects and also for this week's Parsha, Parsha Sekev. Let us let begin with a Gemara that everybody learns until a few years ago, nobody fully understood this Gemara. Only in recent years do we understand this Gemara in its context. The Gemara in Gitten, Daf Nun Vav and Midbeis tells us that Titus was such a Russia that when he went into the base Hamigdash, he took a sword and he stabbed the Parochus. Hashem made, Hanesk happened, the blood comes out. If this Meshuggah thing thinks he's going to kill Hashem, Chas Shalom, so the Ebeshtah made, the blood comes out of the Parochus. And Titus thinks he has won over the Rabbi Nishalei. He goes out to see and suddenly his boat starts shaking. And Chazal tell us, Titus says, oh, Hashem thinks he's powerful because he's only powerful in the sea. But you know what? On the land, I'm the man. Abishta waits. Titus gets on land. And then the Abishta takes the smallest creature in the world, a small little yitush, a gnat. And this yitush goes into Titus's nose. And by the time they open up Titus's head, after he's dead, <coughs> that little gnat, that little yitush became as big as a tzipur durar is the first sheet in the Gemara. As a songbird, come to my museum. I have songbirds this small. I have some songbirds that are this big. So the next question in the Gemara is, the Yitush became as big as a bird, a tzipur durar. How much did it weigh? So the first sheet in the Gemara is, it weighed kemishkal shnei slaim, the weight of two slime. I brought you tonight a 2,300-year-old ancient coin, a sella.
And the 2,500-year-old Sela, the Greeks called it by the same name, Sela, S-E-L-A, as the Gemara calls them. This denomination, even though they're 200 years apart, if I hold them side by side with each other, are exactly the same size and the same weight. How much do they weigh? 17.5 grams each. According to the first sheet of the Gemara, the fly had become so big that it weighed kemishka shnei slaim, the weight of these two coins. First sheet in the Gemara. That everybody is clear. Let's go to the next opinion in the Gemara. It weighed kemishkal shnei litrin. Lamid yud tes reish yud nun. Litrin is plural. Litra is singular. Take this safer. Midas shiuri atayir from Chaim Benish from Bnei Brak. This is an encyclopedia of shiurim. It's now out of print, but I went to the author's house and bought the last 30 copies. If somebody wants to buy it, who's interested in shiurim, it costs $50, you can buy it from the Living Tower Museum, and it's an encyclopedia of shiurim. Chaim Benish in the Sefer Midas Shiuri HaTorah has a whole section only on the machloikis of how much is a litra. There's a section here. Litra v'chelkeho. Litra and all the subparts of a litra. There's a machloikis between Rashi, the Rambam, and the Rif. How much is the shear of a litra? Now sometimes you have a machloikis and one says it's a little like this and it's, the other one says it's a little like that. Not here. I'm going to read you from the Sefer. This is Perik Chavches in his Sefer of Midas Yishiyur Yatera. Shitas HaRambam HaLitra, and he gives it in grams, 148.7 grams. Rashi, 354 grams. Big difference. The Rif and the Gainim say, 425 grams. That's a massive difference between 148.7 grams or 425 grams. Rabbi Yashid asked me, Rabbi Deutsch, Efshir a museum in the Welt, maybe there's some museum in the world was hot agansa litra that has a whole litra. We could be mevar what it is. My nafkemina, an Eruv, if you want to use Eurokos, you have to use a literal Eurokos. Nafkemina la'alacha. There wasn't. The British Museum has a cut literal. Getty Museum in California has a broken one as well. We couldn't determine 100%. I think I spoke about this a few years ago. Rabbi Yashiv had a huge surgery towards the end of his life. That week, my scuba divers are in the Mediterranean Sea. And they pull out a weight that was made of lead. Now, if you remember 10th grade chemistry, gold, silver, and lead do not change in water over time. I don't know if you remember 10th grade chemistry. They pull out a, a lead weight And on the weight, it says litra. I'll teach you some Greek. Upside down V in Greek is an L. I looks like the American I. T looks like the American T. R is a P. Like in Russian, a P is an R. A, we put it on a scale, and it's exactly Rashi Shita of 354 grams. I was so excited. 
Rabbi Yasha was not a person who sat and spoke on the phone, but I was like to talk to him on the phone when he needed. And I call his private number. He's not picking up. And for me, this was very strange because Rabbi Yasha was a person you could have timed him according to the time of the day. You knew where Rabbi Yasha was. An hour later, I call back. No answer. So I let the phone ring about 20 times. And his grandson, Ari Eliyasha, picks up the phone. And I said to him, I have to speak to Rabbi Yashif. The Rav is yet in the Beit Cholin. The Rav is now in the hospital in Anituach, in a surgery. I told him, go to the Beit Cholin, go to the hospital. And when he opens his eyes in the recovery room, whisper into his ear that we found the litra. 20 minutes after he's wheeled into the recovery room, Rabbi Yashiv opens his eyes and he whispers into his ear that Rabbi Deutsch called from New York at Midgifun in the litra. We found it. Efsher kennst du ihn beten, das bringen zu Eretz Yisrael. Ich will solche sein, einmal in mein Leben halten, a litra. Maybe you could ask him to bring it to Israel. I want to do it once in my life to hold the litra. My whole life, he said, I'm learning about the litra. If you read my Sefer on Chumash Bereshis, in the introduction. People always ask, why do I have to know all these antiques? What do I need to know it for? You need to know it because you need to understand Gemara. You need to know it because you have to understand Halacha. You need to know it because you have to understand Chazal. This here is a picture two days after Rabbi Yashiv is released from the hospital. Rabbi Yashiv is sitting and holding the litra. And he said to me, I want to invite every single person here who's in this room. At the end of the presentation, I'm leaving it out. I want you to take one hand and hold Kimishkal Shnei Sloim and hold the litra in your other hand. And for the first time, you could learn Gemara Gitten and Daphnun Vav and Poshit, see the Machloikis, if the fly that went into Titus's nose was Kemishka Shnei Sloim, thirty-five grams, or three hundred and fifty-four grams times two. This is a massive headache right over here. This is the machloikis in the Gemara. Just in case any of you want to know what Titus looked like, that's an actual coin of Titus. And that's the nose that we have been talking about for the last 15 minutes. Picture of Titus. This is a Judea capta coin. The Romans minted this coin in honor of destroying the Beis HaMikdash. What we were crying about, they were celebrating. I'm leaving this out here for you to hold as well. So now that we've finished a little bit about Tishabov and a little about Titus and why these artifacts are so important, I want to turn our attention to Parshas as uh, First we'll start with Duvarim, and then we'll go to Vashanan. Rabbi Lasha Paskin de la That's one of the things that Rashi wrote Baruch HaKadosh. So people always ask, what about the Rambam, or what about the Goinim? I, can, I only know that what you go by what you find. I'll tell you a funny story I had with Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky. When Rabbi Yasha was Nifter, Reb Chaim, by the way, he loved antiques. And he, I used to bring him anything he wanted to know, he wanted to see. We say in America, a picture's worth a thousand words. Um, you can all look at this picture of Reb Chaim. Look at his face. I don't know if there are three times in Reb Chaim's whole life that you saw Reb Chaim smile like this. 
picture's worth a thousand words. The Kitzer, Surab Chaim says to me, Zog me Iber, tell me over, als was mein Schwert ach gesagt. Everything that I heard you, I, your, my father Laura, said to you. Well, it took me a year and a half to do that. Every time I, I went into him, sometimes he was feeling better, sometimes not. So I tried to tell him over all the things. So when I came to this point, that I told him that Rabbi Yashav said he would pask in the shear of an air of, of Yerokos with the discovery of this litra, Rabbi Chaim said to me, Sa often a Gemara. It's an open Gemara. The Gemara tells us that Rabbi Bar Abchana once met an Ishmaelite. And the Ishmaelite told him that he knows and he saw the bones of the Mese Hamidbar. The Gemara says, Rabbi Bar Abchana and the Ishmaelite, the Ishmaeli, went to see the bones of the Mese Hamidbar. And Rabbi Bar Abchana was so taken by this that he saw some of the clothing of the people still intact. And he cut off a piece of uh, clothing. And suddenly he became paralyzed. He couldn't move. The Ishmaeli told him, we have a Kabbalah that anyone who takes something from the Mesei HaMidbar becomes paralyzed. The Ishmaeli takes back the fragment of clothing that was just taken and puts it back and suddenly Rabbi Bar Abchana is able to move again. He comes to the base Medrash, the Gemara says. And he tells the Chachamim what happened. The Chachamim said to him, Amru lai Chachamim, why didn't you check the Chutim of the Tzitzis, the knots of the Tzitzis, if they were Kebe Shammai or Kebe Hilla? Sir Rab Chaim says to me, Adi Gemara Gevolt Machlitzain da Halacha. From Tzitzis, Kibay Shammai, Kibay Hillel, with the discovery of the clothing of the Mesei Amidbar, Zicha came in Paskinen, when man gefind as ach was me weiss nicht. Sure, you could Paskin. That's why we were Rashi film. Because in the time of the Rift, they found film like Rashi. They Paskin like Rashi. So if that is the case, that we have now seen, that we can establish things based on discoveries when we don't know, there was a project that took me six years, working with Rav Yisrael Belsky, the Chetzalik of Racha, for six years to identify the locations of the 42 Masois. My new book on Chumash Bamidbar, besides having everything on the Parshas, has a special section of almost a hundred pages. The locations of the 42 Masois. Now, how did we identify it? We went back to Egyptian hieroglyphics, we went back to Phoenician, we went back to Amorite and Ammonite, ancient languages. And we looked at the names of those places in those languages. Somebody, I'm waiting for the question, how do you know you can rely on them? Because the Torah relied on them. Learn Parshas Devarim. Har Chermon, v'hatzidonim, and the Phoenicians, Karola Sinir. V'ha Amorim, and the Amorites, Karola Shinar. Eretz Reform, Vaha Amonim, and the Ammonites, Karla Zamzimin. The Torah is using the names in Phoenician, Amorite, Ammonite, Vahoyu Letoitofo is Bain, Enecha, Tat, Pas, Kafti is Coptic, that's Egyptian and African. Dibra Torah Kelashim Benayada. So we went back and we looked up every single name in these languages. In my book, my new book on Bamidbar, these cost $35. You could buy them after the Shiro. You can call the Living Torah Museum number. 
to order. I take you through the Membez Masois with pictures. Where are these locations today? I will tell you that I brought you along something I'm sure you're going to enjoy. This is an Egyptian hieroglyphics dictionary. Some of you may like it. There's a section in the dictionary which is phenomenal. It's called Hebrew Geographical Names. Names found in Hebrew that are also found in hieroglyphics. The Eden went from Ramses, they went to Sukkos. Right here is Sukkos. The Yidden went to Asam. Right here is Asam. From the 42 Masais, myself and Rabelsky identified based on hieroglyphics and based on Phoenician, what they call these locations, we were able to identify most of the Masais. And today we have it in my new book on Bamidbar with pictures of these locations and maps. And if you understand where the Masois are, I'm going to show you a new level of learning the Aseris Hadibris. Anoichi Hashem Elikecha, Asher Hoitzei Sicha, Me'eretz Mitzrayim. Leman Tisker Es Yoim Tseischa, Me'eretz Mitzrayim, Kol Yimei Chayecha. I love asking people this question. What day did Yidin leave Eretz Mitzrayim? It wasn't on Pesach. It wasn't on the morning of Pesach. Because they went from Ramses to Sukkot during the border of Egypt. They went to Asam during the border of Egypt. They went to Migdal during the border of Egypt. When did Yidin leave Mitzrayim? When they get to Piachiris. A week later, they left Mitzrayim a week after Marcus Bechiris. Do you know what they did for the first week? They went deeper into Mitzrayim. They were going deeper to the big Egyptian desert in Mitzrayim. And then suddenly, the Avishta gives them a turn, and they're going to go from deeper in Mitzrayim. I'll give you an imaginary map. Ramses is here. Sukkot is here. Asam is here. Elat is here. Saudi Arabia is here. They are going not towards Eretz Yisrael. Vayihi b'shalach pari es ha'am. V'loi nacha melekim derech Eretz plishtim ki karavu. The Ebeshti could have taken them from right here, the edge of Egypt, taking them right into the border of Egypt today with Elat, go right up the coast, and be in Eretz plishtim. Kiryat Gat, Gat is plishti. Ashkelon is plishti. Kas, yeah. They, Tel Aviv, all Eretz plishtim. Vayihi b'shalach pari asam v'loi nacham alakim derech Eretz plishtim ki karavu. Ki amar alakim, the first sign of war, they're going to run back to Egypt. The Ebeshter takes them this way, all the way deeper into Egypt. And now, after a few days of going deeper into Egypt's territory, Suddenly, the Abishta turns them, and they're going to go all the way from here, all the way down to Nueva Beach, which is in the Gulf of Aqaba, across all the way down here near Saudi Arabia. And guess what they're going to see as they're going all the way back? They're going to pass all the locations they just left from. I want to ask you a question. Imagine you took all the Holocaust survivors from Auschwitz and Treblinka 
and you start marching them away, and then tell all the survivors of Auschwitz and Treblinka, we're going to take and march you right back past where you just were for the last 210 years. Do you understand the panic that Bnei Yisrael felt? Do you understand the panic they felt that at any moment Egypt could come and attack them? And the Abishta marches them right in front like a cat and a mouse. You put the mouse right in front of the cat. What do you think the cat's going to do? Vayichazik Hashem Aslev Pari. Their mouses are coming right in front of my nose. Am I not going to pounce on them and attack them? When you understand where the Masois are, your mind opens up to learn Chumash like you've never learned Chumash before. Six years of work with Rabbi Yisrael Belsky just to do this section on the Masois. The God of Mitzrayim. Now, I told you this in the past, but I was one of these annoying kids who used to ask too many questions in class. I used to get kicked out an average of four or five times a week for asking too many questions. We're learning about Yetzirah Mitzrayim. The women took out their maris hatsoivish al nechoshes, their mirrors of copper, and they donated it to make the kiyar. And I raised my hand in class and I asked my Rebbe if he could please show me exactly what a mirror of copper looked like. My Rebbe was a Holocaust survivor who didn't have any patience for my questions, and he slapped me up and threw me out of class. Don't bother me with these ridiculous questions. Well, that's why I made a museum. I brought you from Mitzrayim. Two mirrors. This one is completely green. It's oxidized. Just like the Statue of Liberty a hundred years ago was brown. Now it's green. It's oxidation of the metal. This mirror, we polished it back to its original form. And like you have a shiny pot that you can see your reflection, this was a maris hatsevish on the I need a boy who's a volunteer. Anyone wants to be my volunteer? No? Come, come over here. You're going to love this. I tell you, this boy is never going to forget what you're going to feel right now. Okay, you see this maris hatsevish on the I want you to touch the edge of it. You see that it's a little sharp? Okay, I'm going to teach you a special halacha in Hilcha Shabbos. Well, I'm going to take one hair of yours, and I'm going to cut it off using a maris hatzai v'shon You're going to learn Hilcha Shabbos, and it says in Hilcha Shabbos, a maris hatzai v'shon is muksa, because maybe you're going to forget, and by mistake, give yourself a little trim. You feel it? Right? You feel me cutting off? You, you felt me cutting it off? Give him a big round of applause. He deserves it. Right. Thank you. I'm leaving my mirrors of copper out so you can hold it and see it for yourself. And in my book on Shemois, it goes through teaching you how they made the Mishkan. But then I had a lot of teachers call me up. Why didn't you write about this? Why did you write how they made this? Why didn't you write about that? So because the Hashem, I gave out a book on Malachim Aleph. Malachim Alf is how Shleim Amel built the base Hamigdash. So whatever is not in the Shemois book on Malachis Hamishkan is now available in my Malachim Aleph book. I show you all the types of gold. People learn Masechtas Yuma. Zahav Shachud, Zahav Mezukah, Zahav Mufas. I have no idea what they're saying. 
You go through Malachim Aleph, I teach you like you know 14 karat, 18 karat, 22 karat, 24 karat gold. I teach you the various different types of gold they were using in the ancient world and what the Psukim in Tanakh are calling each of these and how we know what each one was. Let's now move to Parshas Akif. One thing I will give you a suggestion, don't ever open a museum. <laughs> and I'm not because I'm looking, not looking for competition. The problem is you're going to be asked questions day and night by people who have very serious and good questions and it causes you sometimes to put you in very uncomfortable situations. And that's what happened to me in Pasha Sekif. I was doing a tour in the museum for Aisha Teira from Dallas, Texas. And they brought a group of college students to the museum. And always, whenever I have care of groups, I leave the last 10, 15 minutes and say to them, you could ask me any question you want about any subject, about Hashem, about Torah, Yiddishkeit, and I'll answer your questions. A 22-year-old college student raises his hand. He says to me, Rabbi Deutsch, recently I started learning with partners of Torah. And I learn every week the Parsha. And we learn the beginning of Parsha's Akif. In the beginning of Parsha's Akif, it says, Vinoshal, Hashem will empty out Eretz Yisrael from all the Goyim. But he can't do it right away. We learned it this morning. The Eivishter cannot get rid of all the Goyim of Eretz Canaan in one time because maybe a lot of wild animals are going to move in. If you have a place that doesn't have enough people, who moves in? Wild animals. The most amazing Rashi in the entire Chumash. You know what Rashi says? What's the problem with wild animals? If you follow the ways of Hashem, you have nothing to fear from wild animals. What is Rashi saying? Every person right here is born with a tzelam alakim. Yudke vavke. Tzadikim see if you have it. And also animals see if you have it. Cain kills Hevel. Guess what happens to him? He lost his cell and was like, give me, he lost his ice. He says to Hashem, give me back the ice or the animals will kill me. Temporarily, they gave him back the ice. This Yid continues and says, well, what does Rashi answer? The Yid not going to come and tear its Canaan. They're going to learn from all the Canaanim, all the terrible sins. And they're going to be food for the animals because they're going to lose their tzalim alakim. The Yid says to me, Rabbi Deutsch, how could Rashi say that if a person has how could Rashi say such a statement? I looked at him and I said, because it's true. What do you mean? It's true. I said, Sadiqim, people who, who, or not even Sadiqim, people who follow the ways of Hashem completely, retain their Tzalem Alakim. They have nothing to fear from wild animals. Come on! I said, it's true. The guy is getting frustrated at me. And he says to me, Rabbi Deitch, I have a question for you, a personal question. I said, what? Do you have a Tzalem Alakim? I said, yes. Good. I'm going to challenge you. You climb into the cages with lions, tigers, alligators, elephants, the most dangerous animals in the world, and they don't rip you to pieces, I will become a Shemr Shabbos. He challenged me in front of 50 people. You know what I told him? 
Challenge accepted. Four o'clock that day, Rabelski used to come to the museum once a month. He shows up. I said to Rabelski, I had an amazing story. I told him what happened. Rabelski says, you know, if someone challenges you before Hesse, you have to be muchen to go. Adla Messiris Nefesh, the Rambam says, to show that Moshe Emes Vesera Sayamas. I said, great. Give me a psak din. Rabelski, if you knew him, he stood up, straightened himself, gave me a psak din. You could climb into any cage of any animal. Nobody's going to touch you. Now I have to find zoos are going to let me into their lion cages. Try it out. Tomorrow I want you all pick up the phone, call up the Bronx Zoo. I'd like to go into your cages with your lions and your tigers. They're going to hang up your phone. But I'm good friends with a lot of zookeepers. So I said to them, what would it take for you to let me into your cages? Well, if you work with our lawyers and we're not responsible and there are releases that are signed that if something happens to you, we're not responsible, your family can't sue us, we're not responsible if you're half eaten and your body is there, we're not responsible for your body. I signed all the releases. Eight zoos let me into their cages. I released four hours. These are three. We have the fourth one just came out. Four hours playing with the most dangerous animals in the world. And they're not drugged. They're fully alert, the tigers with their tongues out. And I did things that no zookeeper in the world would have a dream of doing. Number one rule about tigers. You never turn your back on a tiger. If he knows you from the day he's born, never turn your back on a tiger. I walked into the tiger's cage, turned my back on them, and sat down in between nine tigers. You'll see it on this video. These cost, by the way, $20. A tiger's most sensitive part is his nose. I walked over. I kissed him on his nose, scratched him under his neck. It's all on video. Shook his head back and forth. The zuki, you could see in, the, in some of the things I was doing, you hear them in the background, they're, like, they're going crazy. They thought I was dead. Now, number one rule about tigers and lions, never go into a cage with a lion or tiger holding a piece of meat. Do you know why? Because you're a bigger piece of meat. I went to Meal Mart, and I bought chicken. And I cut off just the drumsticks. It's on video. You can see this. Just the drumsticks of the chicken. And I walk right in front of a lion and stick my hand out. Now, the lion has three choices. Eat me up eat up my hand, or eat a little piece of chicken with a little meat on it, on the drumstick. You see him eat the meat, the chicken. I bought some Chalav Yisrael golden flow milk. And I took my hand and started pouring the milk on my hand till my hand was gushing with milk. And I walked right in front of a tiger and stuck my hand out just like that. It's on video. You can watch it. And you will see the tiger standing out licking off all the milk of my hand. When I finished doing that, I decided the next thing I need to do is to go into a cage with a pack of wolves. Now, if you know anything about wolves, there's the alpha male wolf. It is the most incredible thing you will see in your life. As I walk into the cage, the alpha male wolf bends his head down to me out of respect. I started petting him. It's all on this DVD. I started petting him. And then he got annoyed that I was petting the other wolves. He kept sticking his head. I should pet him. A year for Muncie, I released uh, the first one I released was the one on the lions and tigers. So a for Muncie comes, he says, Rabbi Deutsch, I need to talk to you privately. I'm through my whole life, but I have certain svekas. And one thing is bothering me. Lions and tigers, there is an ability of training them. 
They have emotions. Some animals have absolutely no emotion. Crocodiles, alligators, We've never seen a lion can kill a mother of antelope and take care of the baby like their own kid. A crocodile or an alligator will eat anything in front of him. They have absolutely no emotion. Let's see you go into the cage with these kind of animals who have no emotion. I said, that's a good idea. I need a week to find out which is the most dangerous one in the world. And sure enough, if you visit Miami, Florida, next time you go to Miami, take two hours and go to a zoo called Jungle Island. It used to be called Parrot Jungle. They renamed it now in Miami Beach to Jungle Island. They had a cage that had a 17-foot crocodile and a 12-foot alligator. One night, the 12-foot alligator ate up the 17-foot crocodile. They came in the morning and they found the piece of a foot. I said, that's the one I want to go into. So I worked with uh, Jungle Island. I signed all the releases. And they begged me, please don't do it. I said, I'm doing it. At least if you do a rabbi, take off your long black coat and go in without a coat because the alligator could grab you and pull you in the pond. I said, I'm going to go in exactly as I'm dressed every single day. I think I was even wearing this one when I went in. Could be. If I look at the video, I, say, no, I think I was wearing this one. I walked into the cage with the most dangerous alligator in the world who ate up a crocodile that was 17 feet long. She is so dangerous that today, they will not even put another alligator next to her because they're afraid what she's going to do. So I decided this is the perfect one to demonstrate Rashi. I took a fish a little bigger than the size of a sardine. I put it on a stick like you would put a toothpick. And you will see me stand within three feet of the most dangerous alligator in the world and feed it a fish this big. And the alligator has a choice. I'm six foot three or a fish this big. The person became a Shemesh Amis. He learned in Beit Shemesh for a few years. He got married. He lives in Bar Park. He has three children. He became a Baal Tshuva because this Rashi was bothering him. How could Rashi say, We have those DVDs. You'll see me standing next to lions, tigers, wolves. They're available at the end of the presentation. You had a question? Daniel? Because those were man eating lions. No, the Gemara says, Kol tam basar. If a lion ever ate humans, human blood is sweeter than animal blood. With all the animal rights people, they all agree with this. If an animal today kills a human, they have to shoot it right away. Do you know why? Because they're always going to go back to them. The Neil's Chiddush was that they were man eating lions. The lions that I went into their cages have never killed humans. And that's the difference. The Neils is far bigger than this. Because even if they kill humans, even if you have a Tzalem Kim, you're in danger. That was the danger. The Neil and the Malach Hashem had to protect the Neil. But when Rashi writes it, he doesn't write it, it's a Ness. He writes it, Bipshitus, Im Oisim Ritzoinem Shalmokim Ein Misyarim in Achaya. Uh, uh, the Mepharshim and Daniel say it. That's why he needed a, a special, a special nest. But regular animals? No. no that's a law. Daniel is a big discussion. If you want one day, I'll give you a shear in Daniel. It will be. A, you'll learn Daniel like 
different than the way most people are learning Daniel, based on what Chazal tells us about things in Daniel. But let's go further, because it's 9.46, and I still want to cover some more ground. So we covered three weeks. We covered Tisha B'Av. We covered how you know the Masoi is based on what it says in, 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 in um, Parshas Devarim about foreign languages. We covered Parshas Vashanan to show you the Masois. We covered Parshas Ekev. And now I'd like to get to one of my favorite subjects, kosher grasshoppers. We're going to be learning Parshas Re'e about kosher animals. In my book on Vayikra, I give you all the birds that are mentioned both in Parshas Shmini and in Parshas Re'e. I show you every single bird, what they are, according to all the Mepharshim. Each Mepharsh has different opinions of what the birds were. I give you with my Mekoyimus and color pictures each of the birds. Most people learn Chumash think that a Nesher is an eagle. That's because they've never learned Chulun Daf Samar Gimel Amid Aleph. And in Chulun Daf Samar Gimel Amid Aleph, Toysvis Divrahamachshul Hametz writes, Taus Gidoila Mashikoyrin Lenesher Igla. It's a huge mistake that people keep repeating that the Nesher is an eagle. An eagle is an ayat, not a Nesher. If you read my book on Vayikra, you can actually see what a Nesher is. I also have two DVDs on non-kosher birds of the Torah. And then I teach kids. They should know what Korkova Niklov means. They should know all the simonim of a kosher bird. We have two DVDs on kosher birds. And this is time appropriate to learn Chumash and understand the birds of the Torah. What are the Shemayinah Shratzim according to all 19 Shittas? I have all the Shemayinah Shratzim. According. Two DVDs released on the Shemayinah Shratzim according to all 19 Shittas. I also have it in my book on Vayikra. Grasshoppers. That's not an eagle. It's a griffin vulture. Griffin vulture. So my DVD has a cover of a Nesher on it. It's, that's a griffin vulture. You can see what it looks like. And Nesher is not an eagle. It's not my words. Taisa says it. Chizkuni is a das yachid. But the, he's the only one who says that. But everyone else says, that, says not. Now, everyone should please stop teaching that a tzvi means a deer. Please, don't, don't, don't make fools out of yourselves. Open up Gemara Chulin. Samach Beis Amid Beis. The Gemara says, V'hare tzvi she'en lo karnayim ufutzolos. A tzvi does not have branched antlers. When you see a deer, you see these branches that come out of his horns, these antlers. So Rashi says in Chulin, Masha'onu Koirim Tzvi Einoi Tzvi Shal Chazal. What people today refer to as Tzvi is not the Tzvi of Chazal. Rashi says Tzvi is a Steinbuck, it's an Ibex, it's a wild goat. Go to Engedi. And you will see in the natural preserve of Engedi these wild goats still running around. That's a tzvi according to Rashi. Ra Nothing to do. They're deer, but they're not tzvi. They're ayol. A deer is an ayol. Don't confuse ayil with ayol. Ayil of the Akeda was a ram, a male sheep. Ayol is a deer. You remember when you were in second grade and your rabbi said you have to be careful with nekudis? Ayil and ayol are spelled exactly the same, just the nekudis are different. So, next week, Akoi, Dishoin, Toi, Tzvi, Ayol, Yachmar, and Zomer, my two DVDs on animals of the Torah, take you through and show you what's an Akoi, 
What's a dishon? What's a toy? Every one of the seven kosher wild animals. We show you how to, what the mafresis parsa means. What shoysa shesa. I ask all the time people, well, tell me what's the difference of mafresis parsa and shoysa shesa. 95% of the people don't know. On there, you're going to see exactly what mafresis parsa is. There's a split in the front, and there's also a split underneath. That's mafresis parsa, and that's shoysa shesa. So much of what people are learning today, they're hazarding words. And they're not understanding what they're saying. And the whole goal, why I dedicated my life to this, is only Yagdal Taraviyada. When you learn something, you should understand it. Let's take something so basic as the Avne Hachoshin. Oidem, Pitadov, Arekes, Neufach, Saper, Yalim, Shvoi. Achlama, right? All of it, all of the stones. People are learning, they don't know what they're saying. This sefer is called the Shilte HaGibarim. The Shilte HaGibarim wrote down the names in Greek of every single one of the stones of the Choshen. Me and Rabelsky both knew how to read ancient Greek. Haleshem Shebeloshen Yavon Nikras. It gives us the Greek names of every stone of the Choshen. I put the names, can you hand me one of them? Of each of the stones of the Choshen in English. You can buy this from us. Ruby, topaz, emerald, garnet, sapphire, diamond, opal, agate, amethyst, beryl, onyx, and jasper. You're learning Chumash with your child or your grandchild. Take out your set of Choshen stones, stones from the same today, the same as they were in the Choshen, and let your kids and your grandchildren know what they're learning about. People say, why are we losing so many kids that are dropping out of yeshivas? Very simple. You ask me? Because the kids are counting light bulbs and how many floor tiles there are on the floor. Because the rabbi is saying, tell them with them. The Shilti Agi Bayram wrote down the names in Greek. We translate it specifically so when you're teaching children, you can show them. Every morning you daven, you say, Vahor Eneinu Besarasacha. The Torah is in front of us. You just need to know what you're talking about. And if you think this is a wild idea that I'm talking about, no one proves my point better than Rav. You know what Rav did? He went to live on a farm for 18 months. You know why? He wanted to learn all the different mumim of an animal. Rav didn't have DVD players. Rav didn't have books that show him how everything. Rav left the base Medrash and went to live on a farm to understand Tyra and understand the meaning of what you're learning. I want to see what it would be like if a Rosh Yeshiva in any big Yeshiva in the world would announce, Marana Varabaisai, I'm leaving the Yeshiva to go live on a farm for 18 months so I can learn all the mumim of a behemoth. Today you don't have to. Today you could pop in a $50 DVD. DVDs are out of style already. You go call up and order a $50 DVD player, plug it in, your kids are going to be able to see, know, and understand what they're learning. Give them a safer. They should be able to see, understand, and learn, see what they're learning. Give them something that they can see learn and understand what they're learning. And there is no better raya to this style of learning than Rabbi Yashiv himself. And this is where I will conclude. Many times in the Mediterranean Sea, we find a lot of ancient coins. 200 coins stuck together, found in a shipwreck in the Mediterranean Sea. One day, Rabbi Yashiv says to me, what do you do with all your extra coins that you don't need? 
I told him I usually sell them to other museums. So Rabbi Yasha said to me, Ahmad Bey of us at the month in Chazal, a coin mentioned in Chazal, don't sell it to a guy. You'd need this. Kimishka Shnei Slaim. You see how we, we started to share with knowing what's Kimishka Shnei Slaim. These are important things for us to know. So I agreed. The next words out of Rabbi Yasha's mouth was, can I get from you maybe some coins? It's an expensive hobby. Some of these ancient 2,000-year-old coins are expensive. So I changed the subject, and I thought Rabbi Yasha would forget about it. He didn't forget about it. <laughs> Finally, when I saw that there's no choice, I took Gemara Kedush and Dafyid Beis. The Gemara says in Adinar, there are six more, 12 Pandyonim, 24 Isari Talkis, 48 Musmas in 96 country and 192 Prutas. And I put together for my extra coins, I have a set here, for Rabbi Yashif, a set of coins. I brought it to him, and I thought I'm going to be a big hero. This is, by the way, upstairs in his house. Rabbi Yashif used to sit in his kitchen. That's in his kitchen. He used to have Svarim, by the way, in his kitchen. And you see me standing with Rabbi Yashif. And I present to him all the seven coins of Gemara Kedush and Dafyid Beis. Rabbi Yashav looks at him and says, Vifalidus, how much is it? So I said, Samatana, it's a present. Soyne matanus yichya. Ichnem nushke matanus. I don't take any presents. Now I'm stuck. I'm standing in Rabbi Yashav's kitchen. I don't know what to charge him. I can't tell him the real price. Seven coins in 2000, yeah, three and a half thousand dollars in bad condition. Nice condition is maybe 20,000. I gave him pretty nice condition coins. So he tells me, Vifalidus, how much is it? I couldn't tell him a hundred dollars because Rabbi Yasha knows not a hundred dollars. So I'm sitting and thinking what to tell him, and the number 580 flies into my head. So I said to Rabbi Yasha, Finnev hundred achtzig dollar. He gets out of his chair. He goes to a bookcase and he starts looking for envelopes with, takes out singles. Some of the dates of the singles were 1935 and 1950. After finishing doing what he thought was, the, yeah, that, that, that's from my personal collection. Rabbi Yashiv makes a Kenyan on every single coin and I'm standing here next to his grandson. Rabbi Yashiv turns to his grandson and he says to him, Hundred years I lived in a house with no safe. What do I have here that's worth any money? But these coins go buy me a safe. Rabbi Yashiv's grandson leaves to go buy him a safe. I'm standing with Rabbi Yashiv, and he was such an honor. He was such a humble person. He says to me, Rabbi Deutsch, Maybe you have 20 minutes for you. If Rabbi Yashu asks you for 20 minutes, you give him 20 minutes. I said, Zicher. He takes off his glasses and he's staring at the coins. You have them all seven here, the same kind. He's staring at the coins, thinking, and shuttling his head, looking. After 20 minutes, he puts back on his glasses. <laughs> And he says to me, I just figured out 27 halachas in Shas. An asterisk that's missing until the size of a Yisr Talki. You could sit and learn Masech the Sukkah your whole life. If you never saw the size of a Yisr Talki, you have no clue what the Gemara is talking about. A behemoth has a hole in the corner, in the windpipe. If the hole is kashir dinar, the animal could live a year and he's not a trefa. If he is kashir isritalki, he's a trefa. Do you know what it means for a person to close his eyes for 20 minutes and figure out 27 halachas and shas? 
If you buy my books, Ambrosia Shmaiz Vekuba Minra, I give you with Myra McCoy, from Rabbi Asher, every single one of them. So I made him a set. Other Gedarlin came to me, Rabbi Moshe Shapiro, a set. Rabbi David Kahn asked me for a set. Rabelsky asked me for a set. Everybody wants these sets. And we sell them for $725. I could sell them for much, much more money to other museums. I do it for Leib de Torah. Any Masech that you learn, Rabbi Yashiv used to sit with his coins, and he used to literally take them out of his safe, and as he learned about that size of that coin, he did it to see what it, what it was. Now what's really amazing is, I'll use an example of today that everyone will understand. Why did Chazal use coins? Very simple. Everyone had them. If you have a busted pipe in your house and you call worldwide plumbing, I need a pipe the size of a nickel, a quarter, a dime, everybody knows what you're talking about. And that's why if you want to give over shiurim, you did it with coins. Thank you for inviting me. We'll see you next time. Shame you can share your Moses Boston, like your biggest shakat, Rabbi Deutsch, for the very inspiring and interesting drosha and demonstration and presentation. Rabbi Sai, we'd like to give you a shakat to Mr. and Mrs. Noah Karras for sponsoring tonight's shear. Have the great schus for sponsoring a shear or help support Egan Shir Taras Abbas's Tara, the Rabbin, by putting an ad in the journal for in honor of uh, the annual dinner next Wednesday. Call Egan Shir Taras 718 851 8651 or email istyeshivanet.com. We accept uh, cash, checks, credit cards. If you have any ancient coins, please donate them to the Living Terror Museum so everyone could be have enough from them. All the uh, Materials that Rabbi Deutsch spoke about are available for sale on the side of the base Medrash. Yashikash, the woman for coming, Hananya Ben Akash, Emirat Sakarish Borkul, Zakis, Israel, the figure of Hebron, Termitish, and Emma, and Hofis, and Mansitkoi, Yagdal Terviade.